Welcome to the seventh video in this series on harmony. In our last video, we covered tertiary harmony, what it is, why it's so popular in film music, and most importantly, how to use it. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion on non-functional harmony by discussing a far more radical approach to harmony called set theory. We'll learn what it is, how to understand it, and most importantly, how to use it. Before we get started, I want to take a quick moment to thank my amazing patrons whose support of this channel makes it possible for me to put out videos like this. I appreciate each and every one of you and am incredibly grateful for your support. A special shout out goes to my newest patrons, Mark Spooner and Vivek Sundar. I'm glad to have you both on the team and am looking forward to getting to know both of you better in the coming weeks. If you're interested in becoming a patron, the link is in the description of this video. All proceeds go towards helping me make tuition payments for school. With that, let's get started. First things first, what exactly is set theory? Well, in music, set theory refers to a highly chromatic and dissonant approach to harmony that was first developed in the early 20th century as a method to deliberately break away from the triad-based functional harmonies that had been used for generations by that point. In the early 20th century, many composers had grown bored with the traditions and customs of the classical and romantic periods of music, and they began to actively rebel against it. Composers like Debussy, Schoenberg, and Stravinsky were all inspiring a radical change in concert music that would eventually come to be referred to as 20th century modernism. During this period of time, the musical community experienced incredible growth in new techniques, concepts, and approaches to composition. Set theory was one of these innovations. And nowadays, it's still a popular approach to harmony in both modern concert music as well as film soundtracks. In particular, you might recognize set theory as the idiosyncratic sound of scary music in films. So this is well and good, but what exactly is set theory? Well, set theory as an approach deviates away from the common practice of using diatonic major and minor keys. Instead, it takes a much more chromatic approach. In set theory, the pitches of a chord are referred to by numbers, marking a chromatic scale from 0 to 11, with the root of the chord being 0. Instead of using traditional chords like triads or seventh chords or even extended chords, set theory simply just slaps notes together and names them after the numerical pitches used. For example, let's build a chord with a C as our root. Since C is our root, its numerical value is zero. That means that C sharp is one, D is two, D sharp is three, etc., etc. If I were to place random notes above the C, say a C sharp, an E, and F, this chord would be named a 0, 1, 4, 5 chord. And like any traditional triad, whatever chromatic chord you come up with can be written with inversions or open voicings but they will always be named after the most condensed, closed version of the chord. Meaning that the chord will always be named after the order of notes that uses the smallest intervals possible from one note to the next. And that's the basics of it. The point of set theory was to introduce a whole new level of freedom to the composer's ability to choose whatever kind of harmonies they felt like using, regardless of key, function, or even diatonic structure. However, like with most things, when left with nearly limitless options to choose from, making decisions can become a little more difficult. So, naturally, over time, composers began to gravitate towards different approaches within set theory. And we're going to cover just a couple of them. The first approach is called a cluster chord. These are pretty simple. All a cluster chord is, is two notes played along with every single note in between them. For example, let's say I wanted to build a cluster chord off of C. 
All I would have to do is determine what the top note of this chord is going to be. Let's say F. Then I just need to play every single note between C and F. So a cluster chord of C to F would include C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E, and F. Since these chords are made entirely of minor second intervals, it makes sense why they sound so dissonant. After all, the minor second interval is arguably one of the most dissonant intervals in Western music, if not the most dissonant interval. So stacking a whole mess of them together isn't exactly going to give you a pure and pretty sound. Our second approach is called a minor second chord. Not to be confused with cluster chords. I know, it's confusing, but stay with me. Cluster chords are a stack of continuous, uninterrupted minor second intervals. But a minor second chord consists of just two separate minor second intervals. And they're arguably the most common and useful chord types to come from set theory. Since set theory insists on naming chords based off their most condensed and closed voicings, there are really only four types of minor second chords that you can use before they start repeating. There's the 0, 1, 3, 4 chord, which consists of two minor second intervals separated by a half step. The 0, 1, 4, 5 chord, which consists of two minor second intervals separated by a whole step. The 0, 1, 5, 6 chord, which consists of two minor second intervals separated by a whole step and a half step. And then finally, there's the 0, 1, 6, 7 chord, which consists of two minor second intervals separated by two whole steps. This one in particular is quite popular and was largely known as the new major triad in 20th century modernist music. So if you don't remember anything else from this video, just remember that this chord is very useful for creating scary and suspenseful music. Just write out your bass line and then build a bunch of these chords from it. So there is just one last thing I want to tackle before we move on to a practical example in Cubase, and that is the impact of octave displacement. So I'm assuming that if you ever use set theory, it will be because you're trying to write creepy sounding music for a film project, a game, a hobby piece, whatever. In that case, it can be really helpful to know how the way you voice these chords can have a huge impact on just how crunchy and dissonant they sound. Now, we talked about how minor second intervals are very dissonant. They don't blend too well together. But as a general rule, the more octaves you place between two notes, the weaker their relationship becomes. For example, this is a minor second interval. Now, if I separate them by an octave, we're using the same notes, but now, the interval is a minor 9. Much less crunchy. If we go another octave, it becomes even less so. Octave displacement is a very simple concept, but it can have a huge impact on the kind of feel that you're going for within your music. So with that out of the way, let's take a look at some practical examples. All right, so here we go. Let's do this. Uh, let's start by just doing a quick bass line. So I'll do C sharp to C, or I guess that's to be D flat since we're moving down. D flat to C. Then let's go up to an F sharp, and then back to an F. So we've got two minor seconds separated by a tritone. You can do anything you'd like here for the piece. I'm trying to write a creepy piece. And in scary music, there's not typically a melody. In suspenseful stuff there can be, but in just like straight horror stuff, the purpose of the music is supposed to be unsettling. And a great way to accomplish unsettling music is to get rid of a lot of the things people are used to being present in music. Melody being one of them. So the bass line is going to work sort of like a pseudo melody for us. Let's listen to this real quick. <laughs> That's pretty nice. I like that. Generic works. Uh, next, what we gotta do is let's just raise this an octave for the sense of ease. And it's time to build some clusters. Alright, so something we could do is first, let's just start for sake of ease, 
stack everything all the way up before C and decide on which ones we want to use. So let's go with the ubiquitous 0, 1, 6, 7. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. All right. Sorry about that. That was super crunchy. Uh, let's go with this. Excellent. Beautiful. Uh, in, I guess, if you're into that stuff. But I like it. All right. So that's 0, 1, 6, 7. That's pretty common. Let's actually delete that, copy this, bring it over here to get the same shape and just bring it down the minor second like we were working with. And now, just because we can, let's bring it down to F sharp. And at this point, I'm not putting a lot of thought into what I want my clusters to be. Ooh, clusters. Let's do a cluster for the last one. Let's just do a four note cluster since all the others use uh, four notes. So, Really, it's it's kind of simple. You can put as much thought or as little thought into this as you like. Typically, I would spend a little bit of time and I'd try to figure out just what kind of combos do I think work best, what kind of uh, instruments am I working with, stuff like that. But in terms of just a demonstration, this is really as simple as you can get it. Just stack a bunch of clusters with each other. Let's give this a sound. So a couple things to point out here. One is that you don't need to voice lead if you don't want. All right. Again, like I said earlier, with scary music, the kind of the best tool you have is to make unsettling. Since in lots of film music, people are used to listening to nice, smooth transitions, having these jarring jumps can be very useful in making it feel unnerving. If you do want to voice lead it, because you just like to voice lead. It'd be the same basic ideas. Keep common tones in the same place. Do we do we have any common tones? We got the C sharp there, so let's move this up. Um, so there's still gonna be some leaps. Uh yeah, so C to C sharp, D to E, G to F, G sharp to C. That is not the best voice leading, but we're not working with triads, so we can't do too much fancy stuff here. But F to F sharp, that works. Let's see, C sharp, let's get that. Uh, C to C, B is gonna work better, so let's move that down here. Um, let's see, so C sharp to A sharp, E to F sharp, F to F sharp, so no, let's go C. Let's uh, bring that down. Ah, you know what, let's just actually bring these up. You know what, yeah. So it's difficult to voice lead these. I'd actually have to spend a little bit of extra time on it if I wanted to do this, but uh, the video is already getting a little long and there's a couple other things I want to talk about. So a kind of sort of voice led these two. These two are kind of, no, these aren't voice led. The point is you don't need to voice lead these, all right? It gets tricky to voice lead unless you're using the same type of chord, which I'm not using here. Um, and like I said, if you're using scary music, you don't need that semblance. Okay, so there's that. Now the next thing I did want to bring up. So we've talked about how to do the clusters. We've talked about the voice leading. Is You'll see I have two more tracks loaded here, strings and brass. I wanted to point something out. In general, with if you want something super dissonant in your writing, strings and woodwinds will be super dissonant. I mean, let's give this a listen. So that, would, that worked really well. But if you use the brass, the brass will sound even more dissonant. Oh, 
<laughs> yes. I, I like that. But yes, so the brass will always sound more dissonant than strings and woodwinds, and it has to just do with the natural harmonic series and the overtones that each of these instruments create that are part of their timbre or their uh, sonic tone color. I'm not going to go into a whole mess of like why that is, but just know that if you're writing scary music, brass will sound crunchier, it'll sound more dissonant than strings and woodwinds, and you can use that to your advantage. Uh, don't use it right out the bat, but save it for the be like the, just the perfect moment. And with that, we've reached the end of yet another video in this series. I hope you found it helpful. There are only a few left before we wrap it up and get started on the new series that will cover melody. If you found this video helpful, please like and subscribe to the channel and share it with anyone you think would enjoy it. I want to give one more shout out to my amazing patrons whose support helps make these videos possible. I appreciate each and every one of you more than you know. I also appreciate each of you who are watching these videos. Your kind messages, comments, and emails just mean the world to me, and they keep me excited to keep making new content. So in the meantime, keep studying, keep working hard, and as always, keep writing new music.